Om Indram Mitram Maranagni Matarato Divyaha Sasuparno Garutaman Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vedanti Agnim Yaman Matari Shvanamahu Om Shanti 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 To that one divine presence, the seers assign many a title, such as the Lord of the Gods, the friend of all beings, the eternal companion, the fire of yoga, the waters of existence, the ethers of consciousness, the devourer of death, and the one who shines forth the light. Om peace, peace, peace. Om yato vacho nivartante aprapyo manasa saha. Aprapya brahmano vidvan na bibeti kadajaneti. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That from which mind and speech fall back, unable to reach or understand it. The one who attains the bliss of that Brahman sheds doubt and fear for all time. And so it is. Om Peace, Peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Ubanaktu, Sahaviryam Karavahai, Tejasvi Navadita Mastu, Mavidvishavai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May Brahman, the reality, protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. We welcome you here this morning to SRV Oregon, where the study of the Dharma goes on constantly. <coughs> it's Shodashi Puja Day today. It's, uh, Shodashi is one of the ten Mahavidyas. She's an aspect of the goddess and also means 16-year-old virgin. And uh, it's also for us a very special day because that's the day Sri Ramakrishna placed his divine consort and wife, Shisharda Devi, uh, on the altar for worship and worshiped her as the living goddess. And um, they both went into a deep samadhi together and it became well known as uh, a new kind or a new era, new age of Shodashi Puja, uh, where Divine Mother was worshiped in the form in the present day and age. And so it's very significant for all of us. And, uh, because here, of course, Shisharda Devi is our supreme Ishtam, our Ishta Devi. And uh, my guru is her disciple and, and uh, got initiation straight from her hand. So it makes this ashram very dedicated to Mother, Divine Mother Reality, which is something unique in itself all the way through the ages and in the religions. Uh, when you combine it with Advaita Vedanta, which is the other very solid foundation upon which Ramakrishna order has based its spiritual life and existence, then you have a unique path. You might call it Shakta Advaita Vada. And we've, our founder, Lex Hickson and I, when we went to India, came upon that path, the name of that, 
that name of a path and thought it was as close as possible as could be assigned to what SRV, Sharda, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda associations could be defined as a combination of worship of Divine Mother and non-duality and you could say was well, that a combination of duality and non-duality because Divine Mother is a form but then you're not understanding the highest reaches of consciousness in which Divine Mother oversees everything as the Supreme Goddess, as the wisdom in every word, sometimes they say. She's got her formless form too. And then she herself says in her own scriptures, which of course you'll have to go to India to find, um, that when everything melts away at that time called Pralaya, then I reside with Brahman. I, I myself go back and merge into the formless Brahman and then I come forth again when it's time for the next age of uh, Yuga, Maha Yuga to commence and all the worlds and beings come out of hiding, out of their seed state. So it's a beautiful teaching because immediately it suggests that there is no birth, growth or death and there is no uh, birth, life and death or no, no uh, no uh, projections, sustenance and withdrawal really going on, no beginning, middle and end of anything. It's just a continual series of cycles ad infinitum. And the choice then becomes whether I want to get off those cycles or not. So there are uh, two choices really, to live a divine life in those cycles and also or to t transcend them completely like Lord Buddha did. And, and and be gone and gone forever from from bodies and forms, no matter how fine and subtle and blissful the bodies are. So Divine Mother is a, I'm speaking this way on Shodashi Puja, I'm compelled to speak this way, as a, is a, rather a bridge or a walker of the skies, as we'll see in one of these charts, who goes between form and formlessness that easily, that adeptly. And uh, therefore she's a very unique the, the most unique of all beings in in the pantheon of gods. And she transcends the gods and gives birth to them. And the same with the ancestors and the humans and everything down to a blade of grass, the scriptures in India say. So we uh, propitiate her just today and, and as uh, sort of futile to do it, but you dedicate all the wisdom back to her. Uh, it's better if the ego just gives it back to her, like in the case of Sri Ramakrishna, whose beautiful gospel was being read before the live stream audience joined us. Welcome. And, uh, and uh, worship her as the supreme resident of our inmost heart, the inner ruler immortal seated in our heart and uh, commencing everything and withdrawing everything at her own sweet will. That, that's an important phrase that our founder, Lex Hickson, used, her own sweet will, because there's no will beyond that. You'd say, what about Brahman? And Brahman doesn't have any will. Brahman's beyond all qualities, so you can't assign a quality to it, and you can't even speak about it, or you can speak about it or around it, but you can never describe it. The Dharma is what comes closest to describing it. But Divine Mother is something very unique. You say you can't pray to God. That's not a possibility in our tradition because God is transcendent, doesn't have ears. Uh, you're already one with that, so you're actually really praying to yourself, they say, when you pray to God. Your divine self, that is, not your ego self. Um, but you can pray to her. She's your ishtam. Your, uh, and uh, in our case, we have an, a physical embodiment of that ishtam in this age with Shisharda Devi. Very hidden behind the scenes, even when she was embodied. Lajja Patavritti Nicham Sharda Gyana Daike, the wisdom mother appeared in form, but as very, behind a very modest veil. Swami Abedanandaji Maharaj wrote that song about her. And uh, which we will probably sing tonight at Sudasi Puja. So, Her own sweet will, then, is, is what we resign ourselves to if we're wanting to sacrifice our egos and become like Sri Ramakrishna was, entirely egoless, almost not even in the body. Uh, a wisp of separation only occasionally appeared in him 
every, every other time he was one with her and therefore one with Brahman. Like fire is one with heat and heat with fire, as is said by the tradition. So with that said, then, we welcome you to this Portland ashram. I wanted to say a little bit about it. There are always four or five inmates, we call them, here. Uh, dwellers inside of the heart of the ashram who keep it running and sometimes uh, sometimes in this day and age a kind of uh, changing variable uh, but there are beings here who uh, uh, possess the, the rare boon of living in a in a, a house or a place that is dedicated to divine reality and basing their whole life inside of that and around it which is very commendable uh, from one standpoint, and it's actually should be seen as purely natural, so what everyone should be wanting to do, turn their house into a temple. Uh, this this is a, a house, Christ said, and it should be turned into a temple, so, uh, you know, the purity is there on the body, it must also be in the location. It's called drovia shuti, you have to make your location pure, and then if you're coming from the outside in like that, then you'll make your energy pure next. That's called Kriya Shuddhi. The energy with which you do action, with which you think, and your acts and so forth. And then finally you'll have the opportunity to make your mind pure. And the thing about these great seers that we worship and whose scriptures we recite and study, their minds are already pure when they arrive here. So it's an entirely different affair with them. We have to try and understand that in the West, <coughs> these unique souls. and they're not that many, if any, being born in America or in the West, uh, not of the kind that uh, is of the non-dual nature. And Christianity rarely saw them, uh, uh, saw saints, you might say, good-hearted beings and so forth. But the seers of non-duality are, are extremely rare, and they tend to gravitate towards families that will not impede their spiritual life with job, family, children, money, now, all these things are okay if you're not of a monastic vocation, but they still uh, pose potential blockages to your spirituality, towards your attainment of liberation. And we must say liberation and salvation are two different things there. Everyone should eat their salvation. It's rather easy to do now that Sri Ramakrishna has come. Holy Mother said, now everyone, even the, even the, the mean and lowly, you see, that is those whose... Who's, minds are still crass and gross, and those who are suffering greatly from lack, uh, they can also get their salvation in this lifetime. So it's a matter of offering this <coughs> ego to, to that ishtam, that ideal. Some of you have said everyone must have an ideal and in life. It's best to have an ideal. It's sort of like in this Christendom, you know, getting to the Father through the Son. So that you can always rely upon. I just chanted about that. Indram, Mitram, Varuna Magnir, Matarato, Divyaha, Sasuparna, Gurutman, all those gods are listed. Uh, and Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vedanti. So, I mean, one truth, many paths leading to it. It's one of the ancient, well, it is the most ancient saying in any scripture of any religion about uh, universality. Ekam Sat Vipra Vedanti. Uh, one one truth but many paths leading to it. Sometimes you say one summit and many paths going up the mountain. Or the Lord is one but it has many names and forms. All of those are universal statements that you look to call out of different religious scriptures and, and make the uh, center pole upon, around which you should revolve. So you always remember, I am the Father, I am one with the Mother. That accompanies you in every act in life. So these beings have attained that, and then they come back into, into form. Uh, Buddhism, <coughs> Tibetan Buddhism, Hinduism, Yoga, Vedanta, these are all darshanas, or paths of seeing, which will uh, keep this, help you keep this one great truth in mind. If, it, if religion doesn't keep that one main truth in mind, doesn't give it to you, then it's failed its main mission, and it starts to degrade and descend. It will anyway over time. As time tends to do that to everything. Uh, time heals all wounds, but also it wounds all heals. <laughs> so uh, you have to um, 
be aware of the evils of time, space, cause and effect, and keep your mind in that state that is above them all the time. They've come out of you, like animals, for instance. They've come out of you, you haven't come out of animals. So science is posing it backwards. And on the physical level only, with no involution going back, you see. But you, you came from somewhere. There's no such thing as nothing. So you came from something. And it wasn't dust, by the way. That's metaphoric. You, came, you can't create a soul. A soul is eternal. How can you say the soul is eternal in one sentence and the next say it was created from dust? It doesn't matter. It's, it's contradictory. Make up your mind. <laughs> Make a conclusion. If the soul is eternal, then say it's eternal and be eternal. And uh, yeah. uh, make sure you explain the metaphoric meanings of things like creation or seven day creation theory or four billion, three hundred and twenty million year evolutionary theory. If you're, sci you're science on one side and theology on the other, that becomes between a rock and a hard place, as my teacher said when he came here. Yeah. Uh, then uh, you, found, you find this middle way, this middle ground, and you, you uh, find that it's going to be called non-duality, and then you station yourself in it, and you're steady there. This is the mudra for it. Shiva's mudra, you see. It's got the foundation of Brahman, and there's the lingam and all that. You worship, you see. Stay steady in, in your stance, and then you have arrived. And after that, you don't entertain any more doubts about it. And you become Im, Im, uh, uh, impossible to, to penetrate. Ignorance cannot penetrate where a sun is. See, darkness can't come where a sun is. So you become that shining sun of Vedanta, that summit of the mountain, and then you can observe all paths and pick and choose. Eventually, you'll be holding two ideals. You'll be holding the idea of non-duality, and you'll be holding the ideal of service to God in mankind. Because man is not God until he realizes he's God. You can't say, I am Atma Brahma, the self is Brahman, or I am my father one, until you've sat under a tree for many days and <laughs> had that realization, and then come out with the light and said, I am the light of the world. It's happened to both Christ and Jesus 550, and Buddha 550 years before him, all sat under a tree, went into a forest, and got their act together, as we say nowadays saw they were one with, with reality, call it Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, or, or Brahman, or Almighty Father, and great spirit, and, and, and then proclaimed it. So that's when darkness is gone, and ignorance is no longer real, and doubt doesn't penetrate anymore. You're, you have the courage of your convictions, and it's on the non-dual level. And then you look upon the world as, as a, a mud puddle in the hoof print of a cow, mm -hmm. unreal and nothing in it can, can uh, hurt you, so then you can venture into it to help the world? No, to help souls. The world can take care of itself, you might have noticed, in the 15 million years you've been here, if you were a monkey and so forth. So, uh, <coughs> it'll be here long after, uh, if it's to be after human form disappears from its face. We're not the form anyway, we're the essence which projected the worlds. So uh, some of that is in these beautiful slokas of the Adhyatma Ramayana. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm always saying that, Adhyatma Upanishad, because I'm such a fan of the Adhyatma Ramayana and have read it and we've studied it. I defer to that saying, but Adhyatma really means the original soul. Atma, uh, Adi, you know, it means the one uh, indivisible all-pervasive, birthless, deathless soul, with a capital S, you might say. Because in the West, we, we think of soul as, as uh, something that got created, but that was never the case. It appears that way because of birth, life, and death. But Krishna clarifies that in the Gita for Arjuna, right on the battlefield, and uh, tells him that uh, birth, life, and death, and beginnings, middles, and endings are all happening in maya, in nature. They don't happen in the soul. Mm -hmm. So that immediately gives you a kind of foundation upon which to shift to the soul, you know, shift to your unchanging consciousness, and then become the witness consciousness, or the great observer, the great actor, the great renouncer. If you were watching live stream last week in San Francisco, you saw that chart, and we studied it, Yoga Vashista's teaching of how to live in the world 
after you've attained knowledge and wisdom because then you see it's unreal and why should you stay here anymore? You don't feel like working, your desires are gone so you don't need money or family. So how does a person who is Jivan Mukta like that operate in the world? There's a, even a book called that, of something of that nature. Is, is a Jivan Mukta ba still bound? Right? Just because he's in the body, he or she is in the body. Well, these next five slokas are what I call the Jivan Mukta slokas of this Upanishad, because they all end with this statement, liberated in life. That's how I found my teacher, Swami Sheshananda Maharaj, who I said earlier was touched by the hand of Shisharda Devi herself and given initiation into spiritual life. So um, the mantra, is her mantri, his mantri guru, uh, that's quite a thing, an achievement to have the Divine Mother of the Universe as your mantri guru. Um, you're sort of like a son of a king, they say like that. Yeah. Samipya, it's dear, dear to the, so if you're dear to the Lord or if you're a son of a king, you don't have any worries. <laughs> Everything will be provided for you, so uh, you don't really even need to desire. Everything's fulfilled automatically. Holy Mother used to say that even about herself. She said, you know, I've never had anything in life, but everything I thought of came to me. So the minute she'd think it, she said it would come to her. Mm. A, a lychee fruit or something she wanted to have. It's just, gee, that would be good. Here, here it is, Mother. You know, so. So all of these things come to your door, and you don't have to go outside of your door one step. You'll receive all the lessons, chastising lessons of life, staying right inside your own house. That's words of a song in India. So uh, you, you don't need to take one step out to your house. And if you do, you better make sure that step is taken with mindfulness, right, in everything you do. Mindfulness and thought, word, and deed. So you don't create any karma out there. If you do create karma out there, then make sure you destroy it that night in your evening's meditation before you go to sleep. That's why they want you to meditate, you know, the minute you get up and uh, before you go to sleep, mainly for purification reasons, so that you don't accrue karma. Visions of God and all that, they'll come later. Uh, you need to be about clearing the mind of cobwebs that are there in the depths of the cave, I guess no one's walked back there for a long time, but there are also new spiders at the front of the cave creating webs, you see. So you need, must keep these away. They're like Kriyamani karma is called fires, like putting out fires, we call it nowadays. These things are coming up from seemingly nowhere, <clears throat> but there is no nowhere. So they're coming from somewhere. So those are your daily actions. It's called mortal, mortar and pestle karma in India. You know, if you make bread, you're going to kill something, you see, or something's going to die. Something tiny or something larger. Get away, fly. You swat it and it dies. You see. So you're always accruing some little bits of karma, and um, you keep that clean, keep the, sli the, the slate clean every day. So going out to work in today's atmosphere is very difficult to do that. I've had four or five meetings since I arrived Wednesday with people who are saying pretty much the same thing, how hard the workplace is right now for them, and uh, how adharmic it is, how uh, against all the <coughs> moral and ethical codes, and also against one's own spiritual leanings and aspirations. You know, certain things you want to attain, you want to do them dharmically, and it becomes doubly hard to do that after you have yourself straight, when the world isn't straight around you. And so there you are, walking that razor's edge path. Quick, Tistata, Jagrata, Prapya, Varoni, Bodhata, approach the wise teachers and learn from them. Because sharp as a razor's edge is a spiritual path and difficult to navigate. Swami Vivekananda used to love that saying from the Upanishads. <coughs> and he would wake you up out of deep sleep with it in the morning. If you hadn't gotten up by 3.30 or 4, shout that at you. You have to pop awake. And go meditate and see what happened in your deep sleep state, and your dreams, and clean them out. Uh, dreams aren't something to be attained. They can't be attained. Dreams are something to be wiped away so that you see the true nature of yourself, which is beyond dream. Here in Vedanta, we want to wake up from all dream. And this is dream number one that you're in right now. And when you go to sleep tonight, dream is dream number two.
who said that? Ramana, Ramana Maharshi, yeah, the great, and probably the most current of all the truly realized souls we've seen on earth. He's more current than Vivekananda, is, yeah, time-wise, historically-wise. So these living, liberated slokas, five of them are coming up next. Let me read to you <coughs> what we did uh, what we took last time I was here, I have notes here, start here in February 2007. And then down here, start here in May 2007. <coughs> so I, at the end of each class, so I remember, because we're always absent for two months and come back and see you again, um, <coughs> gives you time to really study these scriptures. So, uh, in fact, back here I say, it says start here in October 2016. So that's back there where we, where we started before. To listen is to pursue, by means of profound sentences, their powerful import. On the other hand, ordinary thinking consists of perceiving thought as being consistent with mere reasoning. So to truly listen, let's say, is important. By means of profound sentences, well, the East is famous for that. And so at the Chinese restaurant last night, I got a fortune. See, a short saying often contains much wisdom. That has well been a Chinese Upanishad there, you see. <laughs> so you look into these scriptures with their sentences and you unwrap them. Precisely why? Because what I just said was the secret key of it all, is that mother exists in every word, in every letter, as intelligence. And we don't look at her like that. She's got a you know, ten-armed goddess, six-armed, four-armed goddess, and so forth. Maybe we're looking at her as Mother Nature or as a hu human form and so forth. But basically, she's that subtle that she's the very intelligence inside of you. She's allowing you to understand what I'm saying right now through the senses. So she's also the Lord of the senses. And, uh, and she has her minions, too. Uh, the senses are actually little gods, and they all function according to her if you if the ego sacrifices them to her. If not, then the senses go their own way outward and have their karmas and sufferings and pleasures, and they get involved in that, and the ego delights in that, you see, and becomes demoniacal even in its pursuit of those things, <coughs> say, in some materialistic country, I won't mention any names. So you need to uh, control the senses would be so easily done if you could just offer them to her. You wouldn't really have to, like Captain Bly, take out your eye and polish it and put it back in. It's not like that, it's purification of senses. You know, you, the senses, you have to think of things as they're in, in their innate purity. They're resting in their innate purity. Purity is consciousness with a capital C here. And if you, that's just a shift of the mind is all it really takes. Your mind isn't thinking that way, so it's impure. If you were at the um, <coughs> live streaming classes last Saturday, the one on Sunday, we had trouble with the live streaming, so it's going to be reposted, but, and you can look back on it, but we were talking about the first slokas of the Amrita Bindu Upanishad. Amrita means nectar and Bindu means like a, a drop. You see, or like the third eye is that bindu, and an aspect of the wisdom word in which mother intelligence exists. So, first Soka said, you know, mind with, without desires is pure, and mind with desires is impure. Couldn't really have put it in any simpler way. It's one of the most easily to understand Upanishads, and it doesn't start out with anything abstract uh, or thickly philosophical, it just starts out with this, this statement about the difference between pure and impure mind. So <coughs> you can try and render the mind pure by all sorts of exercises, come to find in the end it's dual by nature, so it will never really be pure. You were, you know, might have uh, realized that along the way. But there is a pure mind that exists beyond the brain, and it's full of wisdom, and it's full of memory of your past lifetimes, and it's full of all the things you've learned. All knowledge lies within you. Uh, <coughs> and, and that mind is innately pure. It's, they call it, in fact, since it's confused with lower mind, they call it no mind, or 
or they tell you to destroy the mind and those kinds of things. Buddha mind, Buddha nature. So uh, that's a good way. Uh, it's, it's not so much of an act to purify that you're after then. It's a stance you want to take. If we had been given by religion the non-duality in Christ's message, say, I, my Father, one, be thee perfect, those kinds of statements, and that had been emphasized first, and origins had been put second to that, in the beginning was the word, because Christ knew there was no beginning, then we would have this stance already, it would be natural to us, and this is the way India has been living through millennia, with this stance already intact. And you see it in their people, even nowadays in the darkest age, uh, because they're not acting that much different than the rest of us anymore. Some Thirty battleships sailed into my backyard some months ago. And each was flying the flag of a different country, and one of them was India. But where should I salute here? It's all warmongering. So, <coughs> flexing of muscles. Pray to God, but keep the powder keg dry, my teacher used to say. <laughs> See, it's hypocritical. If you believed in God and prayed to God, you wouldn't need might and force, power. You'd be peaceful. And then Attila the Hun and Alexander the Great and the Romans and the English would all leave your country because you, there's no resistance there in you. Resist not evil. So, hey, this is no fun. They're not fighting back. So you become otherworldly like she was, transworldly and not worldly itself, worldliness as a chronic disease, Sri Ramakrishna said. Its newest form is, is <coughs> distraction, multiple distractions from the, from the point. So you can see it everywhere. I arrived Wednesday, went outside, I'll, oh, I'm coming out of Ramakrishna Loka. I came from Ramakrishna Loka into Ramakrishna Loka. I go out into the Ramakrishna Loka neighborhood. No. <laughs> Before, you know, people might have cast glances at you. Now they're not even looking at you. <laughs> They're just looking at screens all the way up and down the street. They were looking at screens on their porch. What happened to sitting out and looking at nature, at least, you see? So, the, you, you know, it, on the positive side, if you, you were not to be critical, then you would say, uh, they want everything perfect, you see? Because if you look at nature, you're going to find imperfections. If you look at people, you'll find imperfections, so you don't want to deal with them. So you put it all perfectly on a screen and you look at that, you see. Kind of like a sort of blinders that people put on nowadays. But to see the truth, you're going to have to have 20-20 vision or better and see uh, in all directions, like an omnidirectional microphone here, here in all directions. Your, your eyes have to, you have to have eyes here open and in the back of your head have it all to see. And then, <clears throat> then uh, if there if there's disparities and and unclarity, <coughs> akyati, uh, you know, instead of kyati, clarity, then you look into the words of the scriptures and the seers to find the truth. It'll always be there because it doesn't change. It's the one one thing you can depend upon. And dharma is the best represent representation of that truth. <coughs> so, when we say it's start here in February. 2017, let me read you the one, two, three, four slokas we took last week to refresh your memories. And I'm sure you've all memorized them by now and you can recite them and discourse to your friends about them. We've got that all down, right? Right? What's that you say, Bobji? What'd you say? <laughs> 39 and 40. When the load of innate impulses gets dissolved, that's in your mind, Without residue, by means of this cloud of virtues, heaps of karma, good and evil, are totally eradicated. Like Sri Ramakrishna said, putting a match to cotton. Well, that's the best way to get rid of poof, it's all gone in an instant. And so you, you want to get rid of your karmas quickly, then <coughs> and entertain this rain cloud of virtues inside of you. <coughs> That which shines forth immediately, unobstructed, yields spontaneous awareness. As clear as a fruit in the palm of one's own hand. Hasta Amalaka. You should be able to see your true nature as clear as a fruit, as you would look at a fruit in the palm of your own hand. Be that certain of it. It's a beautiful stotram. 
The young boy didn't speak for 16 years. Shankar asked him a question, who are you? He said, he recited 12 verses. First words he ever spoke in his life. I'm not a householder, I'm not a monk, I'm not a forest dweller, I'm not a man, I'm not an angel from celestial places. I'm, I am the all-pervasive Atman, I am everyone, I am everything. First words that ever came out of the boy's mouth. His name was Hasta Amalakas Ananda. He was one of Shankar's disciples. So they're referring to the fruit of the palm of your hand. And Holy Mother used to refer to that too. She, they asked, kneading bread on the floor, M Mother, you're just involved in work. Can you keep Brahman in mind all the time? Or how, how is that possible? You know, she says, yes, it's true. I'm involved in work just like the rest of you. But any time I want, I can reach into my wearing cloth and pull out my true nature and look at it as easily as you would be able to pick up a fruit in the palm of your hand and gaze at it. So she could put work, life, family, children, everything away immediately, anytime she wanted, and just see her true nature. Because it immediately shone forth and yields her spontaneous awareness. The next sloka was, the non-occurrence of the impulse to enjoy with regard to objects of enjoyment marks the acme of this det detachment, this ability to take your mind off of anything. The impulse to, to enjoy goes away. However, the highest pitch of awareness is marked by this non-occurrence of the ego's pastime. But the next uh, draws a distinction between enjoyment and bliss. This acme of withdrawal is marked by non-occurrence of even the latent impulse to, to enjoy. Thus, that one is the ascetic of steadfast wisdom who enjoys bliss forever. So, there's a kind of person that will, will just cancel out the latent impression to enjoy, both inner and outer. That's Savitarka, Nirvitarka, and Yoga, a samadhi that gets beyond objects and beyond thought of objects, too and just lives in this bliss, and that's all. And there's the kind of person who will get that kind of uh, ability and come back to the world and move amongst the sense objects and enjoy them thoroughly without getting attached to them. See? And then falling below that, you see the dharmic householder and the monk, you might say, or the jivan mukta, is uh, all these beings who are in various stages of withdrawing themselves from the world, haven't learned the lesson yet that it's as uh, empty as it can possibly be, it has no fulfillment for you whatsoever. It has come out of you. I used to try and describe that to people by saying you're praying you know, while you're in the body here, but what is here already is what you prayed for before. So this is your prayer's manifestation in front of you. And now you need to make the best of it, right? And so you're going to be, you know, I mean, environmentalists, God bless them, they don't have to worry. Nature's not going to get destroyed. We'll be gone long before it is. In fact, nothing gets destroyed. It just gets reformed again. So best to then say, this is my prayer. The result of my prayers here, I have to treat it reverently. And if I do that, then environment will be fine. I'll be fine with nature. I won't run afoul of the gods of nature. I won't get bound, therefore, I'll be free. When I take my last breath, I'll give it up easily, and I'll just live in a state of, of uh, equanimity all the time, creating no karma and having none at the end, which was the meaning of my teacher's name, Visheshanandaji, having no residue at the end. That's one of the ways you could define his name. So, um, enjoying objects that are unreal <coughs> as compared to uh, having the bliss of the object by knowing its true nature, knowing that it's unreal, yet being to, yet knowing that the foundation of it all is your own consciousness. See, objects are your own consciousness. Holy Mother used to say that objects are just a thought made manifest. Someone had to think this, and then it came into an object. It doesn't just happen in the physical; it happens from the subtle to the physical too. That's when, when she starts working the word, she uses the word right. That's in the beginning. So um, she starts using the word, and at that time before she starts using it, meaning is here, ob thought of object is here, the actual solid object is here, the sound that the object has, the word that's associated with the object. All these things are floating 
disparately in this mind, this consciousness. She starts using the word, she'll congeal. It's called raga, attraction. And that's what's holding the atom molecules and everything together. Can't quite explain that to the scientists yet. But that power of attraction called raga is a cosmic law that's holding all this together, cohesing it. And it'll just as easily, when she takes it away, diffuse. Just like the in external tree, the internal tree, and the transcendent tree, basically. Everything is like that. Every object is like that. So there was a time when it was just in your mind, and then there was a time before that when it was in God's mind, the Mahat, the Great. And some congealing power came along and brought that down in stages. And if you study the 24 cosmic principles, that was Copley's way of telling you in fives how that happened, quintuplication process. So these are both uh, dissolution of the mind stream with the 24 cosmic principles in it and the meaning of objects are both covers of books we put out in SRV. Uh, finally been colorized, you might have noticed. So we're starting to present the color versions of these charts in retreats and classes and also available on the website we're forming so people can, I hope, put them on their walls over your baby's crib, mm -hmm. over your dining table. You may not be very popular right away at dinner parties. Mm -hmm. People will run away screaming. All they did was talk about the truth there. I don't want to do that at a party. So you might not be very socially popular right away, but people will come around and they'll see uh, that uh, they weren't raised with this truth. And so to be raised with that truth would be to be fortified completely against all these ills, against the ill of taking the world to be real, when it's just actually particles changing in a bit into a second. So those were the slokas we took last February, evidently from my notes. So start here in May. That's with sloka 45, which says, 43 and 44. Is that incomparable one whose self is merged in Brahman alone, who is immutable and quiescent? That one's wisdom, pragya, is defined as the unwavering spiritual mode, the contents of which is the unity of Brahman and Atman, purged of all limiting adjuncts. Whosoever possesses that wisdom, existing without a break, is liberated in this life. Sort of like the chant I started off with this morning, those who realize Brahman, which speech and mind cannot comprehend, they'd shed fear for all time. So doing the same here with purging yourself of limiting adjuncts, like I am the body, or I am the prana, or I am the mind, and seeing that uh, you're the overseer of all those layers of consciousness, that you are the essence of them all. Instead of looking at them from outside and saying, I want that, or I don't want that, you look at it from inside and say, I produced that, and I can get rid of it, if I want. And you're master of your own destiny, and you're Jivan Mukta, you're a free soul. It's all a matter of change of perspective, uh, if it isn't possible for you to make that change of perspective, then you're going to have to practice yoga. See, this, uh, Vedanta and yoga have an eternal relationship, but yoga is practice. I mean, not in its essence, it's union, but yoga as a, as a discipline is practice, and, and Vedanta is a statement of truth, absolute truth. So you could see how the two could work together very well for people who cannot yet understand say because for 2,000 years they've been called a sinner. They cannot yet understand, you see, that I never was separate from God. I am that God. You know, we sometimes we say to the children, you know, the wave comes off the ocean, it says, I am the ocean. The other waves laugh at it, right? So it sinks down to a hollow, all depressed, you see. Next time it sinks down there and it comes up and it says, I am water. And all the waves start to laugh and then they scratch their watery heads and well, he's right. We are water. So when we say the self is God, we don't mean this body-mind mechanism. We mean the essence inside the body-mind mechanism. You have to look behind all appearances for the essence. And that's precisely what teachings in Buddhism and Hinduism do for you. So um, as far as unwrapping the sloka, whether we do it in India or in China, we look into a, a statement and we start... 
uh, prospecting for its meaning, because the uh, Upanishad says that you look for Brahman or, or truth like you would look for sesame oil in a sesame seed, or like you'd look for uh, gold in a river, or uh, you know, uh, in, any uh, any cause and effect. You'd have to start the process by by uh, or seeking its origin. It's called utpati in Sanskrit. Very, uh, very um, powerful practice that starts with reasoning, as the Upanishad says here, but has to transcend the intellectual frame of reference. If you don't transcend the intellectual frame of reference, then you'll be there in the scientific uh, wisdom of the day, and that's as far as you'll go. And you're creating a groove at that time, and you're making your money on that, and your your ego is invested in it. Your wisdom is in, your ego is invested in its knowledge. And like Einstein found when he tried to replace Newtonian physics, you, they're stuck in it for hundreds of years, thinking Newton was the highest. But then Einstein started thinking beyond Newtonian physics into the quantum, toward the quantum leap and level, and found so much resistance to that. You see, nobody could think beyond that box. Now it's like becoming natural. But it takes hundreds of years for these kinds of thoughts in any given field. You know, at first you have to recognize a seer. He was not a seer spiritually. He believed in God, and most of the other scientists didn't, but. He was a seer in that level of expertise he was a genius in. Uh, so in any field, you have to always keep open for the next highest truth, the next glimmering of wisdom that Divine Mother herself is going to show you, like the famous Hindu mathematician Srinivasan and so forth, who, who said all my mathematic, mathematical formulas you know, were given to me by Mother. <laughs> and the Harvard intelligentsia was saying, no, Oh, you, you have to prove them. You don't believe that. See? He said, well, I can't really prove them. They were given to me. So he had to find some other mathematician to help him prove them. And they were well ahead of their time, and so nobody would accept them for the longest time. Even though they didn't accept him, they saw that it was genius, and so they, they gave him the highest honor. You know? but, uh, and he was the only man of color that ever got that honor in the West. So uh, it, it again, you know, it makes you think about how long India has been thinking from the right perspective. In Buddhist, in Buddhism, right orientation is like you put that first of the eightfold path, and everything else almost comes to you naturally in time, maybe in a short time, swiftly. But if you don't put that first, then you're you're kind of uh, going against the grain all the time. You're trying to prove, you're trying to purify something that's already pure. And that beautiful saying is that the self is not made pure by the eight-limbed yoga, and it's not made pure by bowing at the Guru's feet, and it's not made pure uh, by destroying the mind's waves. It's already pure. See? So that non-dual mind, or that self, or that Atman, you have to start out knowing that about itself. And if you've been taught for thousands of years that you're impure, it's going to be very difficult to convince a groove 2,000 years deep people have walked along. Like cows walking and forth from the barn to the field, they'll wear a groove up to their knees. So they go the same path all the time, and that means all lifetime to lifetime. So you're not going to get away from that kind of thinking should you take it upon yourself to try and change things. Lots of them don't because they realize that change is the uh, all alluring trap that everything's based on. It's called Maya, samsara, if you will. So they won't even go near that. Ramakrishna said, You never study Maya. Was, Look at it from a distance, you know, like you would a fog bank, and watch the sun dissipate it. If you're in the fog bank, there are bears, you know, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, everywhere in there. See, and your every sound is a ghost. You see, and the sun melts it away. You realize none of that was there. It was just your own projection. So Maya is like that. You get into it and study it, or try and make a new, you know, a new discovery or something, and your ego's behind it. Then you know you're, you're just studying change. You have to write a new book in ten years about Saturn's rings. You know, the last book you have to throw away, ten years later. So that's. 
you're thinking you're getting somewhere in that. You're just going around in a circle all the time. So you get off the circle and you, you realize your true nature, out of which all of that was projected by a great mind. It's like going to Lord Brahma finally and saying, you've got a marvelous collection of worlds, but I'm clean, I want to get out of the bath. And you, like Vivekananda said, the world is just a gymnasium, flex your muscles and get out. It's good to be born in a religion, don't die in a religion. God is not in the world, the world is in God. I mean, go on giving you these one-liners, you know, not so much even as fortunes, but as you know, uh, declarations. But if you don't take the de declaration as an ultimatum and put austerity behind it, affirmation is not going to do it. And, and you're going to not recognize a great soul when it comes before you. And maybe those are only coming once, like Christ and Buddha, maybe only once. Gave you the message, you should have gotten yourself free right away by hearing it. But in the case of the march of ages, then darkness starts to descend over religion, all religions, and they fall and they rise and they fall and they rise. That's basically what's being said up there. From age to age, I've embodied myself forth for the protection of the good and the destruction of the evil. I have no desire to be here. I've fulfilled myself completely. I do this for loka sangraha, the highest good of all beings in all the worlds. So that kind of soul is selfless. We saw that manifestation recently here on our own soil when Swami Vivekananda arrived in 1893. And uh, he was the harbinger. He was the authentic one. He was the bringer of the new Dharma. And the way he described it was the, new, the religion of this new age is called the Four Yogas. You can look at this uh, chart I made on that over here at the break that one of our ashramites here uh, purchased and framed and is going to map. You can see the new religion of the age right there in its bullet points pulled out of the Gita and the Upanishads by these great scriptures and follow it to the T and get yourself free. You could do it in six months, Vivekananda said, if you put your mind to it. But what is it going to take, what you're going to have to sacrifice uh, to know the truth so that the truth will set you free? That's the question. So let's look deeply into this uh, purging of limiting adjuncts. And that was uh, Slokas 4344 of this Liberated and Life Sloka. Let's take 45 and then look at this chart here. Who has no conceit of I with regards to body and senses, nor conceit of objects with regards to things other than them, who is free from these two conceits is re in regard to anything whatsoever is liberated in this life. So you, you might say it's the ego's penchant to be conceited about its body and the senses and also the objects that it covets. That's all the ego's doing. It's two kinds of conceit, one of them for body and senses. Like Vivekananda came here and said, wrote back to his brother monks, you would not believe how many instruments they have for taking care of their body, you know, for painting themselves, for their toilet, for curling their eyebrows. They've got a little you know, apparatus for everything. So vain. I mean, he didn't even think of his body, ever. You know, Krishna used to say, oh, there's an Aaron. He goes around with his eyes staring in the air like a bird hatching its mother, a mother bird hatching its eggs. <laughs> See, he, his hair is tousled, his, you know, cloth thrown around him. He's always thinking of God. He didn't talk the body at all. They saw him once, some English or, or American, staying in one of their homes, you know, pacing in front. And then he'd stop and look in the mirror at himself, and then he'd pace. And they were thinking, you know, oh, even in Swami Vivekananda, there's some conceit, there's some vanity. And he turned to look at that time and says, you know, it's very funny. No matter how much I look at myself in the mirror, I can't remember what I look like when I walk away from it. <laughs> we were talking about people who, like Sri Ramakrishna, looked in the river and went, eh. Nah. See, he hadn't seen himself for, for years. Holy Mother going to... Uh, 
going, uh, or, or Sri Ramakrishna going to the Nabahat right across the, if you've been to India with me, right across the courtyard where she lived, separate from him, uh, and seeing his picture in there that some Muslim had taken, you see, a Muslim cook, I think, had taken this picture of Sri Ramakrishna in the early years of photography. And Holy Mother had seen it and kept it in the Nahabat where she lived, this little tiny hut, you see, and worshipped it, worshipped her husband long before people were worshipping Sri Ramakrishna, that, which five or six million are doing now in this world alone. So Sri Ramakrishna walked by there one day, she wasn't in there, looked in and saw that picture and bowed down and worshipped it. And he didn't know who it was at the time he was doing that. And they so later said, this picture shows a, a man in a very high state of consciousness. And then eventually said, this picture will be worshipped by millions of people around the world. Who would say that about their own picture? Is that conceit, or is that truth? Did it come about the way it was said? Was it prophecy? It really hardly matters. What matters is, is that you get the meaning out of it and follow. You know, follow the way. Just keep your, your mind on, on the tried and true path. And there are many ways in which you can get off that. So it has no conceit to body and senses and no conceit of objects. So if you want me to help you rid yourself of any conceit for objects right now in this class today, then we can look at the meaning of objects according to Vedanta and Buddhism. Now you see this is a, also the cover of a book called uh, Dissolving a Mind Stream, which is the chart I placed here for you. So the kind of things that uh, are the non-self are listed here until you find the self. Uh, everything from earth, water, fire, air, ether, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, seeing, those are the ten senses and ten, uh, ten senses and, and elements outside. And you've got those ten duplicated inside of you in dream state. So those are the ten subtle senses and subtle objects called tanmatras. And then those ten make ten times two make twenty, and then you've got the fourfold mind. Basically, that's the twenty-four cosmic principles. That is the non-self. None of that's the self. You see. And so Lord Kapila, the first one who did his homework, gave us that list long, long ago in India. Interesting that he was born in a place called Kapilavastu, the, the home of Kapila, and that was where Buddha was born thousands of years later. And he followed the Samkhya system before he, well, he never founded Buddhism, but before Buddhism started to form around him. Because there was no Christianity when Jesus walked the earth either. either that was an add-on or a growth. So, uh, the non-self, but if you want to get down to a specific object and look at it, like science has done, then you should come to what we call a Siddhanta conclusion. When you saw the thing was empty and it was just an appearance, that it was lying to you, basically. It was Maya, and its nature is to be other, you see, than reality. And then, and you didn't say, well, if it's lying to me, I don't want it. You know, then you can say, I don't want it in two ways. I'm going to renounce it completely, and I'm never going to covet it or think of it again. I'm going, I'm going formless on it. You see. Or you can say, I'm going to renounce it, but still use it. That's a monk and a householder. Or you can say, I'm going to renounce it and use it, but I'm going, only going to use it when I know its origin. And then you start studying it, and you find out its origin is in your mind. It came out of your mind. It's concretized intelligence. Matter is just concretized intelligence. But if you study intelli if you study matter, and you find it empty, then you're going to have to say, well, intelligence must be formless. It's not something I can see. It's something I can see the effects of. But if I say I see the effects of intelligence in the object, and I don't really have any of that intelligence realized yet, then I'm worshipping Maya. I'm a mammon worshipper, plain and simple. So uh, you have to see the formless nature of things, uh, and then you have the truth, and then see what you do with it. You see what your temperament uh, decides to do with it after it has a wise choice in the matter, not prior to that, where it just jumps in and you know takes to the self doesn't even know what it's taking. 
it not only does not know that it's taking something that's going to decay, uh, it's empty of the ability to fulfill and it's empty of abiding substance, both. Uh, but it's also, you're not aware that it's just your own thought made solid. And it doesn't get created out of nothing, that it has a seed. And it's not created by God because God's not a creator. All of these things are the bullet points to knowing what an object really is. So that you won't have any conceit of it anymore. So your ego won't covet it. It won't be attached to it for the wrong reasons. And maybe it will give up all attachment to it. Or maybe just utilize it wisely now. And so you have really kind of three higher paths there. You can, you can go formless on it all, as the great ones quite often do. <coughs> you can move amongst the objects of the senses and, and enjoy them, knowing that they won't fulfill you. <laughs> it's a kind of enjoyment that's transcendent. Or you can uh, begin to serve others with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, the suffering, particularly, because the healthy don't need a doctor. Since you're not going in front of people proposing uh, wisdom that they already know. Like when Mashishta came to earth, his father, Lord Brahma, told him, there's like three or four kinds of people down there. There's those that will hate and revile you, as Jesus said. And then there are those who uh, uh, will run away at the sight of you. you know, they don't want to know anything. They want to be stuck in ignorance. They want to suffer. Vivekananda made that statement. You don't understand, he said to one of his American disciples, there are just as many people born to suffer than are to enjoy. And some of the seamen on purpose, they want to suffer on purpose. They like suffering. You might have seen some of them. So you might know of some. So uh, there are those possibilities there in Maya. But um, to, to be able to serve them is to be able to stay free of the, of the uh, misconception that their suffering is real. It's about as clear as I can put it. And it stumped Buddha and it stumped Ram, both, the, the, this compassion, this kind of compassion that's still based on the fact that their suffering is real. It's the most subtle move of all the mind can make to shift away from emotionalism in that way, to become transcendent, to know that that being your suffering is God suffering, and the suffering is just a false superimposition over God. It's like darkness in a cave, Sri Krishna said. It's gone as soon as you bring a light in. So as soon as they want to quit suffering, they will quit suffering. And that's when they will see themselves. And you can see, you know, be a master of all the dynamics around well, how that happens, you know, or what's involved in it. But the pure end result of it is, is that suffering is not real. That's why you resist not evil. Because it's, it's all Maya, and you haven't yet withdrawn from it to get the perfect view of that, and then been yourself again. You're not intoxicated anymore by attractions and allurements and coverings and false superimpositions or uh, limiting adjuncts. You're not fooled by them anymore. There's no more wool left in the stock of Maya to pull over your eyes in the first place. Mm -hmm. The rolls run out. In fact, you yourself are pulling wool out of Maya and put, covering your own eyes off of this roll in back of your head, you see. And finally it ran out. You go, what do I do now? I guess I have to see the truth. <laughs> I know because I have a, a couple friendly sheep now. One of them is called Bad. <laughs> it wants to eat all the lettuce in my garden. <laughs> So I feed it to it, but it, it never gets satiated. It stands around and goes, bad, bad. <laughs> Last year it was the chickens that befriended me. See it. They're ins insatiable too. So I kind of jumped to the chase on the yogic rules pertinent to objects, because I think it's kind of the quickest thing to do. Um, but the overall teaching, and there's a graph on the left-hand side of there, we've been through this before, but the overall teaching is that 
there is, if you take a tree, there's the external tree, and that's Maya. It's Maya plain and simple. It's lying to you, if you want to put it in the, in the language of a truth seeker who wants to know the essence of a thing. And that's just a, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what they say about beauty, it's skin deep. That's the skin deep tree you're seeing there. It's bark deep and uh, leaf deep. It's leaf deep, so you should leaf it alone. It's bark deep, so you should bark at it. <laughs> Withdraw from it because it's an appearance. It's Maya. And so you have to see through it. And so if you wanted to see through what the real tree was, you'd take a bit of it and sliver it. Take hundreds of years to develop a, an instrument to look at it, you know, microscope and electron and so forth. Finally see that it's got all these particles and hopefully somewhere along the way you would be calling them wisdom particles from your own mind because your mind produced it and then it studied it and then it didn't come to the right conclusion and you became attached to it. You became attached to it as a tree to make you money, you see, forestry. Then you became attached to it as an environmentalist who thought that it, it would go away. You see, you'd be deforested. Both were wrong. The tree is, has an essence and it's indestructible. So people go along different paths, good and bad, positive, negative, mixed. Mixed is probably the hardest. And they don't ever realize the truth of the matter, is that the tree essence is the Buddha nature tree. And we heard Dalai Lama say that before. There's the external tree, the internal tree, and then there's the Atman tree, we'd call it. And that Atman tree is back more associated with the thought tree. The thought tree is associated with intelligence. Intelligence is the first thing that came out of the word, like rays come out of a sun. And those are particles of a much finer nature. They're not atomic, they're atmic. And I'm sorry. Questions. Should yeah. I wait for a question? Yeah, at the break. Sorry. Yeah, the live streaming is only why. We're just, uh, but, uh, well, go ahead and ask it. If I'm confused on if an avatar sees that the nature of suffering, as you're saying, is itself an illusion, why are they compelled to come here, or are they compelled? So the question is, so that it can be very well heard, is that um, if an avatar sees suffering as unreal, why do they keep returning to it, help alleviate it? Because they say they come because of the suffering of mankind, but if they see that as an, as an illusion, why are they compelled to be here? But because they have to come to get rid of the idea of that suffering is real in your mind. You know, it's out of their mind. They can take or leave it. They can, they can transcend the worlds and never come back. Like Buddha said, I'm gone and gone forever. So he probably didn't come back. He sent some of his bodhisattvas back, maybe. I always look at it as an octopus because octopus has one eye, so it's a good example. You see, octopus is the only sea creature with its third eye open. But it has all these arms and it's exploring its universe, you see. So avatars is right, sort of like that, third eye open and sending out its tentacles to, you know, pervading everything to see what's there. So um, finds creatures that are living through two eyes only and they haven't made their eye single. You must make an eye single to know the truth, Christ said. So it has to come back to remove the illusion that the world is real in your mind, in the collective mind. And um, uh, so if you were to ask a question like why, then it wouldn't make sense because none of them have been successful to any great extent. When you summon bonum the whole thing, you see that so many billions of people still prefer the stance the world is real. And it's only a few souls that are getting free. So at the beginning of the Gita, Sri Krishna on the battlefield with Arjuna, why is this war happening? Why do I have to fight? My relatives are on the other side. The whole thing is set up. And Krishna says, of billions of souls, only one seeks me. Of a billion of those souls who seek me, only one attains me. Probably just most people have said, I don't think I like this book. <laughs> I'm not going to finish it. <laughs> the opening chapters are like that. What chance have I got? But of course, there are billions and billions of souls who are 
uh, in other realms. The ancestors are, are, are replete with billions of souls, and they keep coming back to Earth. So there's constant recycling going on that chakra-wise is going on in the three lower chakras, Manipura, Swadhisthana, and Muladhara. So those three lower worlds are eating, drinking, sex life, Sri Ramakrishna mm -hmm. said. People are, and progeny and so forth, all based in desire. So, like limiting adjuncts, you know, they're going into these worlds blind, and they're considering them to be real, but from the heart, from heart up, these are souls that have realized only God is real. God is the treasure on the merry-go-round. It's that little ring of truth hanging there mm. you want to grab as you go around every lifetime, and a lot are missing. See, well, the avatar grabbed it once and got free, or maybe it was always free. And it's just God manifest in human form. So when it does that, it's bypassing the unripe ego. It's, it's like you would utilize an object after realizing its origin. The avatar uses the mind after, as an object after realizing its origin. So it's called Atmik Sankalpa. There's all sorts of Sankalpa going on. Sankalpa means mental projection. And all of this comes out of mental projection from the cosmic to the collective to the individual and all the seven worlds in between, or three, three worlds or however different religions propose it. So all of that is flowing out, not down, up to down, like some people think, but you know, uh, inward toward to, to out. It's flowing out from the center. And as it does that, it thickens you know, into matter. Uh, dream matter first and then solid matter last and so if you want to reverse the process like going back from five elements earth connected to smell water connected to taste fire connected to sight air connected to touch ether connected to hearing and you've got the first connections that yoga wants you to make it's funny that this system so ancient is really the answer to what people are complaining about today in terms of insensitivity to nature they're thinking emotionally about nature, but if they're thinking philosophically about it, they would connect five to five, and now they're pursuing a path that's inward, because they will never be able to get rid of people, even the avatars, never be able to rid, get rid of the ignorance in people, billions of people. In each cycle, you know, the avatars come in with a certain sifting machine, you see, uh, off the top, the cream off the top, those who are ready. It's all a matter of preparation, uh, at least from the standpoint of this world it is. I mean, from the ultimate standpoint, it's all just this miraculous play. People are putting on masks to be ignorant. They're putting on masks of evil. You know? So you have to kind of hold this other ideal about it. You know? so that's why you, know, you should definitely be very critical, but you shouldn't be damning. Discrimination is not fault finding or judgment. You know, it's it's separating the wheat from the chaff, and every great teacher has taught that, and every soul who has realized the truth has practiced that. It's the the path of the sun and the path of the moon. The, the world's two great paths, Sri Krishna says, from the ancient times. The moon path of the sun, they go never to return. The path of the moon, they go back to return. And that's why there's, you know, two great nerves around the, sh the central nerve in Kundalini, path of coming, path of going. And there's evolution and involution in the other systems. So the whole thing is based on some sort of transmigratory process. Ultimately, it's not actual. There's just one Brahman that doesn't move. And that's transcendence. That's nirvana, samadhi, satori, beatific vision, Asampragata, uh, Nervikalpa, you know, uh, Fana, different religions have different names for this highest state that they know about, but few people have reached, and the problem is, is that when they reach them, they can't come back to describe what it is. They were a salt doll that walked into an ocean, thinking, I'll come back and tell everyone how deep the ocean is, but it wasn't possible. So only the few that are there who are listening, you see, like the Upanishad said back here, only through 
truly listening one pursues and by means of profound sentences realizes their powerful import. See? That's called shruti, to hear, and yukti, to reason about. And it ends up in nididhyasana or uh, anugraha, you know, to, to realize what you heard. So the billions of people who tried to realize God and didn't were those who practiced shruti. They heard, but they didn't practice to realize. Those few out of that billion who realized God were the ones that followed through with practice and realized the import of those sentences and became Brahman. I and my father are one. And when that happened, Maya falls away and reveals itself as being uh, non-existent. It was a mirage in the desert kind of existence. And that's revelation. Well, maybe it's beyond revelation. But revelation certainly starts it out. If a bush can burn and not burn, or if I can see Christ on the road to Damascus and no one else does, then there must be something afoot, you see, that's not being realized by those standing around me. Last night at Satsang, I was talking about Swami Brahmananda walking into a temple, and he said, I wasn't particularly, uh, I was a little bit dull, he said. This is a great soul who's saying this. Had been kind of dull for a few days, walked into a temple, and it was a circular underground temple, and he was going around the, this way, and around the corner came this light, just washed over him, and he went into samadhi for, was intoxicated for several days. People had to hold him up. Nobody else saw the light come around the corner and wash over him. <laughs> it's coming from inside, you see. Holy Mother said, why do you come see me? Have I grown two horns? <coughs> Is there something outward that happened to me that attracted you to me. Everything that I realized, I realized inside. The truth is within. The kingdom of heaven was within. And I must say that beyond the kingdom of heaven is this transcendence, because heaven is a form. There are two kinds of heaven, lower and higher, right here. You see. If you graduate the lower heaven to a higher heaven through chastity and purity and you know, that kind of thing, then uh, there's a doorway there called true love, and this is true love. You see. So the, those who are qualified for, for the highest heaven will transcend it uh, via their possession of true love. Everything else is the love of the ego, no matter how good it looks, it's just love of the ego. That's why they say the love of the guru for the disciple and the disciple for the guru is, if it's unbreached, is higher than the, than the, the uh, relationship of parent to child. You see how flawed the relationship <coughs> parent to child is. How many intentions there are in it. Some of them not so pure. And we've been raised in that in America. And where are our illumined souls? If the society can be so intellectually adept as to split an atom and realize the power inside of nature, but it hasn't produced a single realized soul yet that wants to help the world instead of destroy it, then what kind of society is that in the end? I'm quoting my teacher. He lived amongst us 40 years and saw our tendencies and was hypercritical about them. Politics, business, religion, nothing was off his scope for pointing out our innate tendencies, our innate impulses that are keeping us bound, that are making us try to dominate others, our children and other countries. And it's not leaning towards freedom. And you can't mince words about it if you teach the Dharma, if, you, if you're a superior doctor, you see. There are inferior doctors, they'll prescribe the medicine over the internet Oh, take this. Bye. Send here. I'll send you the bill on the internet. You'll have to look at it. See. But the mediocre doctor will will write you back. Did you take that? Spirit doctor will come to your door, kick it down, stand on your chest, force it down your throat. Mm -hmm. Who taught that? Paramahamsa Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa 
Shri Rama Krishna Laho Pranam Namaskar Matri Bhakta Yuga Avatar He's the mother of Matri, Matri uh, Bhakta He's the dev devotee of the mother and he's Yuga Avatar the avatar of this age. So he taught that teaching about the three kinds of doctors. And he saw them in India. He never came west in that incarnation. So, um, he was a adept and complete 100% renouncer of this world. Yet there he was, dancing and singing in it. And five million people are now getting free, because he did. Not a lot compared to seven billion, but it's a start. See? Okay, so we took a question on our live streaming class. It's, if you want to ask questions, come to our classes and our retreats. We have one up the Columbia River Gorge this coming weekend called Glimpses of Gaudapada, which is about non-duality, this element that we should have been given, that we need to hear. Shruti, we need to hear it. Um, so there's the external tree there, solidified appearance tree. There's the internal tree, the atomic particle tree. That's the real tree from the standpoint of the physical earth. It's real, it's really vibrating particles. And immediately if you are into self-inquiry or uh, what's the saying, uh, in, uh, inquiring people want to know or something like that, well then you're going to want to know what's holding those particles together. First, what's making them solid to appear other than what they're not? And second, what's holding it together, to, you know, at the level of, of uh, Atman? So you would have to know flavor, color, taste, sound, you know, and connect them to the five elements. And then you'd see where the origin was, that the tree didn't come from God, and nature was just its, its uh, primordial cause. But it actually, the mind is its ultimate cause. It's a thought. And that's where you would get into the transcendent level, that it's really Buddha nature tree, it's an essence tree. It came from something non-material, something transcend transcendental. See. And thought is not, it exists by intelligence, you see. Intelligence, we just said, is mother, right? So now you're finding your way back to Matri Bhakta, we just say, to the, the one who is behind all of this projection. Of course, she will demure. She says, no, not me, it's the Trinity, you see. But she's causing the Trinity to project, sustain, and dissolve things. When it's time for Mahapralaya, she'll say to Shiva, as it were, okay, I'm tired of this one. We've skimmed all the <laughs> wheat from the chaff in this particular cycle, no one else is coming, see. So let's start it over again, see what we can do, see. So then everything will go into pralaya, Vishnu will fall asleep on the lotus, you see, lotus will close, disappear into the Akranava, waters of existence, and then billions of years later she'll, which is just a, a few nights of Lord Brahma, and good night's sleep for Lord Brahma, see. She'll whisper the mantra into his ear, and. and He'll uh, come out and she'll say, here's the mantra, start the creation again. Mantra's a seed word. So there's a seed word for all these. Remember how I said uh, before objects were formed, all other elements were floating. Meaning, sound, word, lo uh, form, all floating from each other. Then it has to be congealed for the thought to bring it to the physical, from inside out. And so it wasn't created out of nothing, and God didn't do it. It was the great mind of God that helped that. And behind that was Divine Mother, you know, who is the proprietress of all these cycles. And her purpose is not that we get in and enjoy and get attached, bound, and suffer, so she has to save us, but that we consciously enter in to those worlds. There's a song in India, uh, I had a desire, I had a desire to 
go out into mothers, the fields of the Lord, let's say. That's a good way to put it in this country. To, into the fields of the Lord or the chambers of my father's mansion. See, I had a desire to leave my, my own room, my own abode and go out and experience these. So I told mother and she said, okay, you may do so, but don't forget where you came from. And she winked at me. See, there's a song with those lines in it in India. So that wink means, you know, don't forget your true nature, your mother, your abode, your own abode. You know, I mean, we often sing about that when, when we do sing, which I forget to do quite often. And we sing that beautiful hymn by one of Sri Ramakrishna's devotees. <laughs> bunch of verses follow it basically is oh mind return to your own abode your eternal home there in the heart with divine mother why do you roam about aimlessly with no real purpose the five elements the five senses the five sheaths these are all different from you none of them are you why have you become senseless in your attachment to these things and forgotten your own true essence. O oh mind, return to your own abode, your eternal essence. So, uh, a very fairly recent song, uh, Sri Ramakrishna's devotees. So, that sort of describes the look at the five senses and the five elements which the Upanishad is talking about when it says that one who has no conceit of I with regard to objects and to things other than them is the one who is free, liberated in this life. So it's just sort of like saying, or straight out the bout, you know, give up your desire for objects. In some way, that, that's what's keeping you bound. Detach from them. They're not you. So if you have to prove it to yourself philosophically, go to a teacher and then meditate on it, prove itself to you experientially. And then give it up. I've had some some luck with people. I say, <coughs> worrying about <coughs> the latest politics, for instance. I won't mention any names. <laughs> That's happened even in the past few days, even with a member of my own family. I said, you know, this is all unreal. You you don't understand consciousness with a capital C. It doesn't change, doesn't move, doesn't transform. There's no politics in it. There's no world in it. There's no worlds in Brahman. They often say that. The worlds are in the chambers of the God's mansion. That's Maya. That's where the non-self sports. Or the self sports masqueraded as the non-self. So then give up your brooding about that. Because Caesars have come and gone and it hasn't made one difference to this world. Not to the world itself of nature, which is insentient and which doesn't even care if you're here or not nor to the world of people. See. And of course not to God, because God doesn't care. Didn't I just say, Holy Mother so it doesn't care for the world. She cares for you. So that must mean you're different than the world. The world is just, you know, producing things all the time. Nature will do that. It just needs its own little environmental bubble to do that. And billions of years to create a certain bubble is is one not good night's sleep or one good night's waking of Lord Brahma, of the power that does that. You don't have to think of it as a god. You can just think of it as a power of projection, the power of creation, if you still believe in creation after this class. <coughs> 
So this is some deeper taking apart of one sloka in regard to the meaning of an object, the real true meaning of an object. Basically, it's empty, and when we say it's empty, we mean empty of abiding substance. Science has even proven that much for us. When the Buddhists saw it was empty of substance, and they were using their third eye for that, not an electron microscope, then they concluded that it should be renounced. Even long before the Buddha, India had a word for it, nivritti. Nivritti, anything from nivritti down, you see most of all of this, is to be renounced. When you see it, you renounce it. It's just sort of like seeing a bear go the other way, you see. You don't covet it, and you certainly don't own it. You can't own it. Why? Because it's empty of abiding, of the ability to fulfill you. It's come out of you, and you want it. Then it's gone, and you think somebody took it away from it. But you can project it again. You're the one that's projecting and providing and taking it away, and there's no God and devil doing that. It's all your own consciousness doing that. <coughs> and that consciousness isn't aware of its doings. To be made aware of its doings would, would be to uh, attain the rain cloud of virtues. Uh, you should have never lost these. But if you have, forgetfulness is ignorance of your true nature is the only sin, if you want to call it that in Vedanta, then, then you need to regain that, and that's where you practice. You bring it back to mind. Vedanta, but yoga, all up here, not here. This is something that passes, but up here is where the abiding essence is. And finally, all objects are mental projections. So we can pick it up there after our break, because we need to break now and uh, come back for another hour's class. An hour and a half went by quickly, didn't it? Uh, how funny how time flies when you're having dharma. Uh -huh. Okay, so thank you for your kind attentions.
So I see we have returned for the second half. <coughs> and uh, Swami Vivekananda said that Vedanta would be like an underground river for the first few hundred years. And over a course of about a thousand years, it would begin to surface. And it would have its rise, <coughs> just like it once had with Vedavyas. And actually, Vedavyas rather symbolizes the end of the last rise. And he, with Ganesha's tusk, Ganesha wrote down the wrote down the scriptures when Vedavyas remembered them all at a time when they were about to be lost. We have 108 of these Upanishads left. There must have been hundreds and thousands of them. Of course, they're all eternal, so they can come back. They come out of the, ultimately out of, stored in your subtle memory of the seers. It's called Shmiti Hetu, this deep, deep causal memory uh, that stores everything in seed form. So nothing's ever lost, nothing's ever gained, nothing's ever born, nothing ever dies. That's called <coughs> Ajativada and uh, aparinama, non-transformation and, and non-birth and non-death, non-projection, non, uh, non-dissolution. So when we're talking about dissolution and projection and, and all of that, we're talking still on the qualified level <coughs> for people who are still caught in that and who want to make sense out of it and maybe even have the option of transcending it, know the truth and be set free. And that's what this next sloka has. <coughs> it says, um, 46, who in wisdom perceives no difference between the subject and Brahman, who neither refers nor defers to creation nor creator, is liberated in this life. So, that's the soul that doesn't need to speak anymore about such processes. Um, they'll come back and they'll help you understand them, but they don't defer to it, nor do they necessarily need to refer to it. But these systems, darshanas, they're called paths of clear seeing. There are six orthodox ones in India and, and a bunch of non-orthodox, which are very powerful, like Jainism and Buddhism. And uh, the six orthodox ones are, are um, brought forth by these souls like Veda Vyas and others and age to age they'll come forth and and, uh, and uh, revivify, it's a nice word because Vivekananda is here amongst us, <laughs> revivify our, our knowledge of spirituality. So before we leave this chart, uh, this graph would be good to look at because it's sort of a, I, I've done this before with other systems and in the overall meaning of object system, you are here, <laughs> you know, like the star map, solid objects and gross elements. You know that those are made of each other and uh, you know the gross senses are there to enjoy them. That one who has no conceit of senses, you know, is liberated in this life. Uh, you can infer the deeper meaning from that. Then the next level of it, after the gross prana, is you have to put it in terms of prana. Man does not live by bread alone, so your body doesn't live, it's animated by something. Your, the objects don't exist, it's animated by something. Rivers flowing, fire burning. Your, uh, your uh, breath doesn't go in and out, it's animated by something. Your senses don't perceive, it's animated by something. It's prana, basically. It's not God, and it's not nature. It's a form of nature, but uh, it's called prana, and it's missing in our, Vivekananda called it missing in our uh, ideologies of the West. It's just not there. And it was very vaguely referred to cryptically by Jesus you know, with his 12 disciples. I see there are 12 here, so Vivekananda said, Vedanta, the underground river, will proceed by one teaching to 12, and those 12 each go out teaching another 12. And that's how it will spread and come to the surface over time. So we need to learn this really deeply, qualify ourselves in it, and be able to explain it to friends and children and so forth, uh, so that it will stand as a, as a resistance and a bulwark, both against the uh, conventions of the day, let's call them, that are not politically, religiously, philosophically, psychologically, are not doing the trick for us, the trick being enlightenment realizing our true self. They're not taking us there. Too many missing elements. So prana is one of them. So the gross prana is operating at these levels, but the psychic prana that Vivekananda brings forth 
that Patanjali and the, fa the father of yoga brought forth is operating on a level of thought objects, subtle elements, subtle senses, and the projected worlds. So all of this happening more at the level of psychic prana. Both of these pranas are like strands of a web that are operated by the spider, the Chit Shakti herself. She's the mother of intelligence, and this is her whole projection. So through the Trinity, she causes that. So it's like, say there were three vegetables in a pot, and you turned on the heat, you know, and they started dancing. And the child looked at it and said, oh, the vegetables are dancing. And the mother said, no, actually, it's the water that's making them dance. Then the father comes in and says, no, dear, actually, it's the heat in the water that's making them dance. Then the grandmother comes in and says, actually, it's the gas that's heating the water that's causing it to be hot, making vegetables dance. All lived in the house that Jack yeah. built, right? I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and then the grandfather comes in and says, you know, I worked for the gas company once <laughs> in my occupation, and there's pipes running along under the house to the street, and it's being fed back to a station and that's what's causing it all. So you're going back f into this structure. So the appearance of the vegetables dancing is sort of like Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva doing their functions of projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. In the old style, they were calling that creation, preservation, and destruction, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And it is, again, in English, it's better words to think about the nature of the word Brahma to expand. and the nature of the word Vishnu, and the nature of the word Shiva. So you know that everything's being projected, <coughs> not out of nothing, it's, you know, uh, there is something at the foundation of everything, and uh, not done by <coughs> ultimate reality, because it doesn't have form, it doesn't need form, it's the essence. So that's where these laws come in to consider, and to contemplate about objects and senses. So these two pranas are being, uh, are functioning. The, the psychic prana is causing us to think and to dream and uh, our highest conceptions and so forth. Even from geniuses' minds, as the psychic prana is flowing through channels that have been opened where other channels have not been opened. Like say Einstein physics compared to Newtonian. Other channels got opened after hundreds of years of thinking in this old ideology, which was good for the time but needed to be changed. So she gets in through those vehicles and causes a certain soul who's qualified to make those changes. And that's a new nadi, we call it, the yogis call it a new channel. It's just like you have blood vessels and nerves going through this body, there are blood vessels and nerves called nadis going through your subtle body. Dream, kingdoms of heaven within, all of that is in your subtle body. So you make these connections again in these systems and it's very helpful. Then, of course, there's the chit shakti herself who's working more on the level of concept of the thought, the mind-ego complexes called antakarnas, and the intelligence that courses through them, all coming from cosmic awareness, the trinity, which is all based in the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, Christ told John. So this is how India had been thinking of it thousands of years prior to Christ and Buddha. This Buddha lived in India, of course, born in India. And this is a kind of stacking of a, a graph, you might say, from gross inward to subtle. We're looking at it that way because right now, as one person told me yesterday, well, you know, my pain from my kidney stone feels real to me. I don't see how you can call it unreal. <laughs> All the world. And I said, so as long as consciousness is focused on the body, then it's real to you. It's temporarily real. But... It, your pain of your kidney stone goes away after the stone goes away, and kidney goes away after the body dies, and thought of kidney and body go away in deep sleep, and you don't go into deep sleep anymore when you have samadhi, so you have to follow these levels of consciousness back to their source too. And you can do that inside of prakriti, nature, and you can do it inside of, of uh, consciousness too. You are conscious, sentient, nature is not. Nature has actually come out of you, put those together, and then you have, you know not only the origins of things, you know where all karmas are forming in nature, due to your actions in nature. <coughs> and that action, those actions are all being done by the mind, not by God, and not by your Atman either, not by yourself. Yourself is, is motionless, stationary, pure, perfect, indivisible, birthless, deathless, timeless, spaceless, shall I go on? 
Yes. Yeah, I want to hear more of that. Come up the gorge with me. We will gorge on Dharma <coughs> next weekend. <coughs> that tea you made for me in the break was like... <laughs> <laughs> The combination of Indian chai and New Age ginger fire water. <laughs> That'll get to what ails the body. Now let's find out what causes the body, <laughs> how to get to that. So I wanted to bring that in. There's other charts that have more other gradations described in a little different way, but I think we can pass from this chart. And before we go to the actual you might say, um, dynamics of practice. There's another system, another way that is proposed using these Sumkic elements in this nice illustration of the iceberg that has a tip and has a bulk. Uh, when I heard about the five Russian dolls and remembered them, I put those into the Akasha chart. So you know there's five different kinds of space, like each doll fitting back into the next. And when I heard about the tip of the iceberg, I actually saw this in a prison I was teaching at once. And I asked the guard, can I have that picture on your window? And uh, they were using it for a different, of course, a scientific or something. But, and so she gave it to me, and I, then I went and found the color version of it. And it uh, shows very, very nicely from, uh, you know, maybe the camera is just halfway above the water, halfway under. You can see that it's like cameras like that third eye, and it's looking at the externals and it's looking at the internals and how they connect. Uh, a very interesting teaching in both Vedanta and Hinduism is that under the surface everything is connected. So I often tell the story of Sri Ramakrishna with his, his companion with him, reaching down to the lake and you know, gathering a hold of one of the ends of the hyacinth plant that was covering the whole lake and pulling it and the whole thing moves towards him. And then he turned to his companion and said, just like that, under the surface, everything's connected. Beautiful, you know, actual occurrence in his life. And, you know, like Christ and Buddha before him, using those earthly happenings and phenomena to illustrate deeper truths. As if nature is always telling you this. Nature comes out of you and out of Brahman. It's not Brahman, but it comes out of that as a projection. So it also carries Brahman with it. But it comes out of you and you don't know it, so it carries pain with it, it carries pleasure with it, and you become conceited around senses and objects. The ego gets a hold of it, and then it's not, it's not conveying its true message to you anymore. And you're running afoul of the whole process and suffering in rounds of birth and death as a result. So they would come back and see if you're ready to give that up, give up that... Uh, false projection that you're operating under, that unreal ignorance, that f false fear, that unreal doubt. That's, you know, ignorance is unreal, so how can it cause you any real doubt, the scriptures say. So your doubt is based on some something unreal, your the un ignorance, and that's based on something equally unreal. And So you've built a house on cards, or on sand, Christ said got to go back and find bedrock and rebuild this. And these systems are, are bedrock of philosophy. Indian philosophy was always mated with its religion. It was never two different things. So philosophy, if it became too dry and sterile, religion came in and, and made it moist and, and devotional. And if devotional got, devotion got too emotional and sentimental, which it tends to do, religion I mean, then philosophy would come and check it and say, no, you know, you know, let's wake you up out of this and get to the truth again. So the, that's the two wings of the bird, really, in India, how we, by which India always flew. <coughs> so uh, the tip of the iceberg is pretty much where people concentrate uh, as reality. You can see there everything that's here and everything that was referred to in this last chart is across the top here from the Mahat, the great mind, to the intelligence that flows out of it, the ego, the mind, the five subtle elements which we're missing too, right? There are earth, air, fire, water, and ether in your dream tonight. So you also have subtle elements and senses element and gross elements. So everything in the whole uh, tip of the iceberg, you might say, is there. That is what we can conjecture about, what we can conceive of. But that's all called prakriti. 
Uh, and then Christ said, that's my, uh, out of which my outer bodies are formed. The outer purusha, sometimes you call it, but my inner purusha is unmanifested. And then I have my supreme purusha, Om, Ishvara, sky of awareness, sunlight of non-dual reality. Metaphorically, you can assign those to this supreme consciousness of Lord Krishna or Brahman, we call it. He calls it too. So out of that formless essence, form came, but it came in two forms. One seed and one uh, uh, manifested, uh, manifested and unmanifested. We're missing this. The unmanifested Prakriti, if you focus on Prakriti in your lifetime, then you think your body, then you actually think your nature. So you will recycle with nature. You'll go back and forth. You will never are nature, but uh, your your soul will will move with nature out of creation, preservation, and destruction, birth, growth, life, death, decay, disease, old age, death. It will move like nature does. But the observant soul, the witness consciousness, you know, sees that all of this has a seed. So if we're looking at uh, this graph, you know, that you're, you're studying all of this to take it back to its seed essence. So all objects, conceit of objects, then you're going to be following it back to uh, unmanifested property. Right, Anurag? Right, Anurag? <laughs> <laughs> So you follow it all back to seed essence, and those seeds are in deep sleep. I mean, if you can equate AUM, you can equate the M to deep sleep. Or you can also equate the M to Shiva, and you can create M, uh, or equate M with uh, dissolution or with death, if you like, you see, with formlessness. So when that M happens, deep sleep, uh, we go into deep sleep, we return to waking dreaming. We don't know that we're bringing the seeds back from there, that continually watering them, that create these, that make these worlds exist for us. If you were to burn the seeds of deep sleep, you would not come back to form. They would not germinate anymore. <coughs> Another simple story with Sri Ramakrishna, you throw a paddy on the ground for the rainy season, come back, and there's a riot of growth. Take the paddy and cook it over a pan in a fire for just a minute, throw it on the ground, come back, no growth. So that simple teaching is really very yogic, is that you burn the seeds of the mind in, that are harbored back there in deep sleep. Unmanifested property are some of those seeds. You're going to produce forests, you're going to produce worlds, you're going to produce gods and goddesses, you're going to produce all the realms out of all of this, all of these seeds. Some of these seeds are massive and more powerful, we have more potency, some are just basic in general, um, and uh, some are so tiny and so small that they're going to wait for that everything to manifest and then they're going to produce other seeds, and that's called suffering. But it's all fraught with the potential of that. So unmanifested property is not sentient, so it can't produce those, but it's going back and forth between seeded and unseeded all the time. And so they call Rajas, Thomas, and Sattva, for instance, AUM of Om and those kinds of triputis, this, these seeds in unmanifested property. And if you equate them to the human being, then you equate them to your own state of consciousness called deep sleep. They haven't been watered yet. They haven't manifested yet. They're all there, and they're indestructible. Um, you can only transcend them. Burning them over a pan, is a, you know, metaphorically speaking, is that you're burning... Uh, the, your, the tendency for you to water them. You're not going to have anything to do with them anymore, so you'll leave them alone. If you do have much more to do with them, then you're in cahoots with nature and maya and the mind and relativity and all these maya and so forth. All of these are going to get together into an equation called life in the realms of name and form, based in time and space, formed by karma, cause and effect the fivefold meaning of maya, name, form, time, space, causation. Nama, rupa, desha, kala, nimitta. So all of this is 
looked at with trepidation by the seers and with greed by the worldly. Their unmanifested Prakriti Lyas want to take that and develop it into worlds and lord over those worlds. And so it's an occult power called domination. It's in there from the very get go. Whereas the seers, they don't want power, they want peace. They don't want suffering, they want bliss for you too. And so they will look askance at it and say, well, I have to go through that realm to get to earth to help those beings. And I know I'm going to be crucified or poisoned down there or reviled, but I'm going to do it anyway and take this on as a sacrifice. So the greatest sacrifice of all is the sacrifice of Ishvara. I always say that about the yagyas. And you're doing sacrifice in return to Ishvara and to the gods and goddesses and to the ancestors and to the humankind and the animals and plants that's called the five yagyas. There's fives everywhere. So. Uh, just a general overall description. You can see other monikers and indications on there. The great mind of God is the Mahat, so it's very much involved in this circle. Gun is in equilibrium I just mentioned. They're, out, they're in equilibrium here and they're out of equilibrium here. So if you were to leave the Gunas alone and just let them stay in equilibrium, then you would not be venturing into them. You would not be taking on three, the three possibilities of of uh, activity, uh, non-activity, slothfulness. Call them slo rest slothfulness, restlessness, and, and balance. You'd not be taking those three on. But you will have to, to, to work your way into any kind of uh, projection like this, any kind of system. <coughs> the soul that's very enlightened at the time of its death and comes back with that knowledge uh, is a soul that's doing it consciously. See, and no matter what lineage it's doing it in or what tradition it's doing, it has its own names for all of these. And uh, like uh, countries have their their own ideations of gods and what they're named, different gods and goddesses and things like that, or devas and devis or demigods and asuras and suras and that kind of thing. Those are all more the conscious principle and it's using property manifested and unmanifested <coughs> in order to express itself and to satisfy its desires. And then when desires come to an end, Holy Mother said, that will be the last lifetime for you. You will not engage in this anymore. You'll come to know the process and you'll divorce yourself from it. That's called koivalya. Father of Yoga said it's isolation from nature and he meant from these two modes of nature. You can't just say, I'm not coming back to earth again and you know not know its origin and the nature of mind that created it, you will find yourself back there again. Maybe up a creek without a paddle. Or you'll come back consciously. You'll see if that so it's all Sancharaha Prati Sancharaha. It's, it's the ancient teaching in India from Lord Kapila. We don't really have any of his scriptures left. Um, uh, Sattva Tamasa Sutra, and, uh, um, you know, there's a few that are attributed to him, but most of those are gone. And uh, so this is attributed to him. There is a chain of transition from unmanifested or non-evolved Prakriti, nature, to manifest Prakriti and its evolutes, ending in the grossest evolute, Earth. There is also a reverse transition of evolutes ending in dissolution into unmanifested property. So this is evolution and involution, and science is devoid of the involution quotient. And uh, your creation theory is based on the creation out of dust or nothing. There's no explanation for it. Here's the explanation of where everything really goes back to seeds. Bijams, you know, the beads on your mala. You know, those are seeds, and they represent bijams. Each bijam, each bead of the mala, Rudraksha mala, has a god associated with it. And so, if you're a really devout practitioner of the mantra, then you take the mala and you put it on a bed of flowers, and you cover it with sacred grass, and you pour milk over it, and then, you know, you, you put sandalwood into it, and you do, do prayers on it, and you, know, you do this with your japa mala every so often, as if, because it's, got, it's the seeds that are containing the essence of those deities. So 
I have a chart on that. It's very beautiful. The names of all 108 of those deities in English. Uh, so it's um, how deep they feel about it, but it's also how deep they know it and uh, how, they, how intensely they practice it. If ignorance gets its root through adamant thinking, skewed thinking, then wisdom also should get its root through that kind of intense thinking. You, you can create whole systems uh, for people to get enlightened by through adamant thinking, you know, profound thinking and deep contemplation. And you're, you're just watering seeds, you'll come to know in the end. But then you'll know which ones to water and which ones you don't want to water. And this is really Lord Brahma's whole function of projection. Vishnu will sustain it, Shiva will dissolve it into the ocean of non-dual awareness. Brahman, or the Paramakasha, sky of awareness. One of those names that we chanted this morning at the beginning of the class, when we say Indra, Mitra, Varun Magni, or Matarato, Divya, Sasu, Parna, Gurutman. One, one of those names is, is uh, the atmosphere of consciousness. They call Brahman, or Lord, the atmosphere of consciousness. So it's a capital C consciousness, and it's not the atmosphere of objects. That's called Bhutakasha. And it's not the atmosphere of Pranakasha. And it's not the ap at atmosphere of Manakasha or Vijnanakasha or Ananda, you know, the, the, the Chittakasha. It's Chiddakasha. So it's the atmosphere of a spaceless space, if you will, the atmosphere of pure conscious awareness. Of course, we know this, Om Purnamadaha Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadachate, Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishishate, one of the peace, seven peace chants that has Purna as its every other word. I know some people alive today who have the word beginning with F as every other word in their vocabulary. <laughs> you know what I mean. And here's uh, what the Indian slokas have. Full, 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 it's all full, it's all infinite. So uh, all that is perceived by the senses is finite. All that is beyond the senses is infinite. From the infinite, the finite has come. Yet being infinite, only infinite remains. So in the end, it's all formless, it's all essence. Even the seeds are gone in that state. So there are beings who get to the seeds and see them and want to manipulate them. And they'll come back again as gods and goddesses and demigods and they're overlording. See, that's their particular desire is to do that. Some of them appear on earth as presidents and emperors and Caesars and so forth. You grant, grant the earth unto them, you know, take unto yourself what's the Lord's. So uh, it's all coming from this seed form of everything. So a beautiful chart to illustrate some of these principles uh, at the top is Lord Kapila's own quote. He says, Prakriti is the equilibrium of the three gunas, not evolved from any other origin, being the primordial source of all other evolutes. Uh, evolutes like earth, air, fire, water, and ether, tasting, touching, hearing, smelling, seeing. A greater amount of this Prakriti is unmanifest. Purusha, the sentient conscient principle, is ever wise, ever pure, and ever free of it. So again, another way of saying that Manifested and unmanifested property is all in the mind and is being projected and withdrawn by the consciousness of the mind. And the head of that whole shooting match is Lord Brahma. You find your way to him, it's like getting to the Father through the Son. And if you find Lord Brahma, then you'll say, free me from these worlds. Or, can you teach me everything you know? So if I go back, I can help, be a better help, like his son Vishishta. Come here, son, I'm going to put you in a state. Puts his head on Vashishta's hand. This is his mind born, one of his mind born sons. Puts his hand on his head and says, The Bijam for Maya. See? Maya Matra Bidam, Dvaita Dvaita Paramata. Puts him into a state of Maya. And Lord Vashishta starts to writhe when he comes back to his consciousness and suffer. And he's out of balance and he's feeling full of anguish and restlessness. So Brahma observes that and then touches him again. He returns to his regular self and she says, why did you do that to me? What was that? 
And that was Maya. Why did you do that to me? Because you're going down to the earth in your next lifetime and you have to know how they feel down there. <laughs> so there are some that go to the Father, uh, the Son of the Father, Lord Brahma, and say, you know, would you, would you, uh, in, uh, would you supply me for that journey? You know, give me provisions for that journey outward to the planet Earth, to the Boer Loka, to the uh, Bhutakasha, a space of objects. And so they come out, you know, in Buddhism it's a bodhisattva. If they come out of a deep state, out of Buddha nature, and see everything go by, they're seeing bardos, we're seeing lokas. So they see bardos, and they see the bardos peopled by different beings from from uh, gross, uh, from causal to subtle, then finally to gross. They see the couple copulating, and you know, choose their parents and born, insert the consciousness in the in into the embryo, just and in the fetus just before the baby's ejected. Don't get f you know formed in the womb for eight months, muscles and sinews. It's painful, so they associate with that process toward the end insert the consciousness into that and come out into the world and are reborn with everything they need for the provision that they asked Lord Brahma for. And uh, so if you venture into this world, you know, don't leave home without that. So make sure you bring the 24 cosmic principles and knowledge of them in some form with you, whether it's in a system like that or whether it's you know, in an in a idea of three worlds, you know, imminent, transcendent, transcendent, uh, uh, absolute, transcendent, and imminent. You'd say this is the imminent world here, and all the knowledge of the workings and dynamics that go on in it. And so, if you did that, you would be more like a walker of the skies. And you mentioned that Holy Mother <coughs> epitomizes that kind of. Uh, realization that Queen Chudala had. She was an ancient queen, and she was much more advanced spiritually than her king. Um, um, Bardwaja, was it, is it the king? So, Shikidwaja, yeah. So Chudala was the queen, and she was advanced in meditation and having, she was walking the skies long before he was. So she had opened up these nadis, these nerves, and was in meditation all the time. It was dancing in your mind, right? You see, it opened up these worlds and was having open access to them, like we do in dream, but we don't know what, that we're the dreamer. And uh, some of the dreams are nightmares, and some of the dreams are wisps and truncated, and no connection with anything else. You know, don't know where we're going. But these souls then are making all these connections and having not just lucid dreams like they're talking about today, but knowledge of I'm the dreamer as you move through these inner worlds. Kings of Heaven Within is a cryptic statement, but Christ didn't just pull it out of his hat to try and impress some devotees in the Garden of Gethsemane with. You know, he, he, he had explored these himself, and eventually he explored them so deep that he found out he was one with the Source, and came out of the wilderness and said so. I am the light of the worlds. So uh, he wanted his devotees to be perfect like that too, and to have that perfect knowledge. and. Uh, the perfect knowledge that would uh, keep them from suffering at the hands of not only the Romans, from their own religion, from the members of their own religion. That's why he said, you know, the enemies in your life will be members of your own family. They don't usually it, you know, unwrap that statement about him because they think family is sacred and all that. Only Dharmic family is sacred. <laughs> Adharmic family is not sacred. You want to get away from that as quick as you can and get yourself free. And then you could help a Dharmic people if you get free. That's another reason for it. It's not escapism. So in this story, which is a story from Lord Vashishtu, whom we just talked about, who had that you know, hand put on his head by Lord Brahma. You're going down to Earth, so you have to know what Maya is like. There are four kinds of people down there. Some will hate you. Some will ignore you. Some will want to qualify themselves for higher learning, and some are already uh, 
healthy. You know, you don't need to address the teachings to them. They're already free. You see, so these other two are, you know, pearls before swine. You're not going to help them in no way, no how. You see, if they show any inkling of interest, then maybe. You see, so, and if suffering finally drives them to you, maybe. But they have to be free with free from both their desires for the world and the inclination towards suffering and ignorance as a choice, a life choice, you might say. Then you'll find people seeking the four qualifications. First of the four qualifications, viveka, see, to know the difference between the real and the unreal, the wheat and the chaff again. And then that they'll start upon their way. You can give them that teaching. That's why you're born in Maya. Sift a few out from, you know, I, I will, I've not come to bring peace. There's no peace in this world, you might have noticed. I've come to bring a sword, and with it I'll separate father from son, mother from daughter. What about that saying? Because yeah, your enemies will be members of your own family, that's why. They're keeping you bound in Maya. Misery loves company. But bliss loves holy company. So they want to, you to be free, like they are. Vivekananda made that statement once, I want everyone to be free, as free as the air they breathe. That was his main reason for coming and giving the Vedanta, not for notoriety or anything. He was, he was a sannyasin. He, he was free of fame and money and all that. And uh, so he wanted everyone to be free. It was his favorite word in English. And what was the day he passed into Samadhi on? Fourth of July. <laughs> real freedom, real independence. So walkers of the skies, you, you, there's a phase of that which you're dancing in your mind, but you know, see it's more toward the level of practice than philosophical systems to study. So you've got the study of a thing and you've got its practice. Basically I've seen like Vedanta and yoga are those two good combinations, two wings of a bird. So here, you, you, know, you, you qualification for higher powers, Ram asks, and Ram is the young teenage avatar that nobody knows about yet at that age, trait to yuga. And uh, only 12 people on the planet know that he's God incarnate. Vashishta is one of those, so he's teaching him. So Ram asks him one day, and Vashishta is an old hoary gray beard at that time, Ram's just a teenager, same with Buddha. You know, Buddha left the palace, so did Ram leave his father's palace. They're thousands of years apart. Sri Ram asked, how does one make oneself fit for the attainment of higher powers? So he's realized occult powers. Occult powers are domination over others, learning how to uh, make yourself small and large and uh, making yourself look beautiful to others when you're not. You know, those kinds of things. Probably the current power of manifestation of that would be cosmetics today. See, cover your, cover your so-called perceived ugliness with some sort of outer beauty and trap them. You see. So painted meat cakes, my teacher used to say <laughs> in the West when he came here. So is, uh, want to, th there are grosser manifestations of the eight occult powers running rampant today all over the world. Domination, of course, is an obvious and easy one to see. Power of domination over others. Uh, one war, America was supposed to be the hero. Then all of a sudden, now it's not. You know, it's being viewed as actually th that it became. Uh, it, it got into the whole business and then got tainted by it, attracted to power. Power. That's why Maya is not something to be messed with. You watch it from a distance. Stay detached, don't study it. Study the atom and come to the right conclusion, or you can study the atom and say, hey, you know, I can use this for power. So my teachers say, the problem of the scientists is that their discoveries fall into the hand of the politicians. Just put it bluntly like that. You should never let your discoveries fall into the hands of the politicians. So how are you going to avoid that? So, Vashishta answers, yeah, story of Shikidwaja in Yoga Vashishta in the there, get 
he says, proper diet first, easy posture, control your prana and your senses. Senses are outgoing, turn them in, because then you'll find out your inner senses, right? And your inner senses are holding the seeds for a lot of these things, and they're also holding your karmas. If you're afraid of water, then you died in a past lifetime, and the little gods in your senses remember that death, and because it thought that death was real, it thought it was coming to its end, but it didn't know that there's no end, and there's no death. Those are illusory. Soul sits and watches its own death so many times, finally figures it out. Aren't you here right now? <laughs> Haven't you died before? Many times? Haven't you had many husbands, many wives, many children? Been different sexes? Women, men? All of that is in the mind, and it's all not just possible, it's most likely probable. So, you know, taking that look at it from a standpoint of the cosmic mind, from a witness standpoint, then you would see how controlling the prana is necessary, and when you do, you'll find out the defects in things. Pure white paper, hold it up to the light, little dots in it, Sri Ramakrishna said. So you have to find those little dots because those are what are impeding you in your return. And the return doesn't mean, at the time of death, it means your return before death, as you're still in the body, because these, these are liberated in life, liberated in life, liberated in life five times. So it's while you're still in the body that you get liberated. That's why Swami Sheshananda Maharaj used to say that, I don't care for a post-mortem emancipation. If Christians would come at him about that. I don't care for that, and I don't care for heaven. But not just only wants freedom, and that freedom is here and now, right now, and is realizable in this very life. And it can be realized by systems such as this. So control the prana, detach from the sense objects, purify the body-mind mechanism, rise above the six passions, secure a path, preceptor, and some scriptural knowledge. There's a juncture there, you see, it's a real turn there when you can do that. You can't really get out of the New Age ethic of hatha yoga and organic food until you can control the prana. It's not about just living a healthy, blissful life of sattva. You, know, you have to actually see the source of food, and you have to see the body, you know, leave it alone in one position. The Advaita said, a kasana is the only asana you want to end up with, this. If you're a, a Western yogi and you're a couch-sitting yogi, you know, then sit with a straight back at least. But if, you know, if, if you can spread the legs like this, it opens up the base of the spine, even physically. And that immediately says, I'm ready for higher knowledge. You're immediately telling your body, okay, let's have an energy come up the spine now. Even unconsciously you're doing that when you sit like this, like the Indian sat. You see. Both kinds of Indians, east and west. Because the uh, Hindu also went through the, his and her indigenous period, the Tantrasis along the Ganges River, the Saraswati River, and so forth. But they were worshipping deeply as well, had names for all the gods of nature, and the senses, the Indriyas. So after you, sh you get that control, then you can secure a path, a preceptor, and scriptural knowledge. Those are called three of the five great attainments. There are eight great attainments, three of them are transcending suffering, have to do with transcending suffering, and then there are five other attainments, and three of those have to do with getting a teacher, getting a path, and walking along that path. And those are absolutes. There's no other way to progress spiritually than that. Because you're getting, remember, you're already free, you're under the illusion that you're not free, and there are certain beings and that are consciously keeping you from being free, and there's nature itself that is insentient acting as a, as a barrier to you, not consciously like some devil out to get you, but, but the very f uh, presence of solidity is a, is a weight on the soul. The senses are weights on your soul, aren't they? Even when they're pure, don't they become weights on your soul? They stop, eyes stop seeing, ears stop hearing. 
So they're, they're defective. And you don't want to be caught in them at the end. You want to have given them up long before that and gone to your subtle senses. And then dance in your mind with them. See? So worship and awakening of Kundalini Shakti happens here. You are now here. You begin to actually worship the creation rather than just use it as a your possession or have conceit of it. You see. see, there's a kind of conceit that could come from realizing it comes out of you too, isn't it? See. So there are philosophers that can stop halfway, as it were. Say, well, this came out of me. I must truly be great. You see. But God loves humility, so the, you're always watching out for these six passions. You see. For instance, if you've already gotten beyond them, then you're not going to encounter conceit of objects and senses when you get here. You'll actually be deifying everything. My teacher, who was a monk, said, renunciation is not condemnation. It's deification. It's a beautiful statement, especially for a monk to make. So you deify everything, and that's what we're not doing here. You know, it'd be good if we could deify each other, like our wives and husbands, and be having you know conscious communion on all levels, physical, mental discussions, and Dharma partners, that kind of thing. That would be great. Vib neighborhoods would vibrate. You see, people would look up from their screens and say, "Oh, there's Babaji. Come on, I want to talk with you." Uh, so, deification. Then everything must be treated with reverence. Like sweeping with a broom, you throw it in the corner. Holy Mother comes up and says, "Oh no, don't do that. It may be dirty, but it cleans dirty places. Here, put it in its on this hook in the corner. You see the closet." So she was very mindful like that. And sometimes we might think mindfulness is just sort of some act we do to appear spiritual to others, or to make ourselves feel better. But mindfulness is actually deification. It's reverence of God in forms. And since we don't see God in forms, and we're not treating everything as God in form, then we're not seeing God as everything. And seeing God as everything is the last word in spiritual life in this world. Who said that? Sri Rakal, yeah. Jaya Sri Rakal. So Swami Brahmananda, the Jagad Guru, teacher of the world, said that. <coughs> If Kundalini awakens, then, and you're sincere in your efforts, then really the game is kind of over already. The deeper dynamics of spiritual spirituality, like the rain cloud of virtues in this slokas, will just present themselves to you. It starts to flow upwards. Upwards means inwards, of course. Up the spine is what he's talking about. And then body and mind gain this new strength. And uh, Kundalini infuses the Puryastaka body, it means eightfold, five elements with threefold mind, basically is the eightfold body. So now you don't just have a physical body, you have the other three elements of the Puryastaka, which means eight, Astaka. So you have the threefold mind, thought, mind, ego. You know, those become infused too. So now you're looking at a kind of an eightfold gathering of forces, you see, that was all working against your best good before, is now on your side. And you've got nature on your side, its powers, and you've gotten your own mind on your own side, its powers. And the uh, result of that is these nadis get inflated. You know what nadis are by now, right? It's like you have blood vessels and nerves, you know. And if one gets pinched and your arm gets atrophied, so there's no blood or no prana flowing through it. Actually, they don't know that, most of them. But in the same way, if your nadis, the, con the channels that are running through your mind, this is actually came out very nice in color. But all these channels that are flowing through your, the various body that Shakti oversees are open, and they're not ending in dead ends and so forth, you know, but they're leading to higher, deeper worlds. And uh, we'll take this up tomorrow morning probably, look at it. But back to here, these nadis become inflated, so prana is flowing through them. Then psychic prana is flowing through them. That is, prana is flowing through your fivefold body, the rest of the eightfold body, threefold. Psychic prana is beginning to 
get on the rise. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll have Einsteins and beings like that, you know, all of a sudden you know, looking around and thinking differently and coming up with different uh, well-intentioned ways of helping people. Make sure it doesn't fall into the hand of the politicians. Or your best intentions will go awry. And you'll have karma for it. Karma is not good and bad. It's not God and devil. It's it's an inscrutable law that you pay to the last farthing with using this body and its karma. Stepping on bugs, saying bad things, lying, doing good when bad happens. It's not your fault. You still get the karma for it. There's a story of man walking across the town with a cow. He's leading it to slaughter. It doesn't usually happen in India, not in the old days. So all of a sudden he sees his ancestors and there's a Shraddha ceremony going on. It's a, it's a ritual for the departed ancestors that they do. And they offer food there and so forth. So it's all about ancestor worship. And, you know, uh, Sri Ramakrishna said, you know, don't, don't eat the food at, at the ancestor. You don't want to buy into that. But anyway, he stops and he partakes of the food. And uh, then he goes on, leaves, says hi to the family and makes his, you know, prostrations and all that. Takes the cow, goes to the, to the butcher. And then when the cow is slaughtered, the karma for its death falls on the whole family because he partook of the food of the ancestors. It doesn't just fall on him. There's a whole sense of karma that falls on them because the food he ate from them gave him the energy to do the act and so forth. There's, karma is inscrutable like this. And we can't just use the word blithely and loosely and throw it you know, out of the New Age party saying, oh, you know, I was King Louis IV in my last lifetime. It never says, you know, I was a janitor of King Louis IV in my last lifetime. No, they want to be grand and great, you know. But the grander and greater is the greater the karma. Yeah. And think how much karma is there in our European kings and royalty for centuries, how much karma. And beings continually being born in that royal line. Now think of you know, the blacks of Africa and voodoo and all that kind of stuff that goes on, you see. I was talking to one uh, sister yesterday about that how much karma there is in that whole race. See. And think of, you know, some sannyasins who gave up their families, erased that karma, and got free. And how there's no more karma left for them. They don't, they, they come back and spend 14 years with their parents and then go away saying, I must be about my father's business. Who am I talking about? Jesus left his family as a young teenager. And there are many Indian beings who left even when they were five and six years old, just walked out of their houses and disappeared. So they realize their mission, they see through the Maya, and they say, oh, I see why I'm here, I have to go do that now. Bye. So uh, it's not like running away from home like we did when we were a kid. I'm mad, you know, I'll never come back. It starts raining, I'm going home. See, they've renounced the world, parents and all, whole get-go, by seeing the truth. So these nadis become inflated. It's a result of beginning to see that truth, and your whole subtle inner body is blossoming now, your subtle body, called sukshma sharira. And that your dreams become uh, more real. You can see see their origins, the light in them, and you know, you're beginning to see that you're the one that's projecting the dream, and the dream is actually a projection. Then that it reaches the, the heart, you see, uh, anahata chakra here. You see, the, the three lower chakras are birth, growth, and death, and eating, drinking, sex, life, and all that, and it reaches the heart, and that's love of God. And unlikely you're going to fall back into the realms of rebirth they say from there. This is the end of coming back to the physical realm. Path of the sun. And so you're at a much more beautiful loka, but even higher than heaven, as we were saying. And you're 
seeing God with form in its most beautiful pre preferred form. Your your ideal you meditated on stands before you, and you're you're dancing and playing with it, as it were, and uh, very blissful. And and then of course going beyond the Son to the Father is is becoming possible for you. Then eternal life is realized. So birth, life, and death don't make sense to you anymore. Coming, staying, and going don't make sense anymore. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep do not make highest sense anymore. Any kind of transformation of movement is uh, rejected by you when you realize your stationary self. Everything's eternal, and I'm eternal. And if there is any movement, it's coming out of my own mind. Should I want to water the seeds there? And I think maybe I won't. in some cases. Then when Kundalini, of course, reaches the Shishumna, it's, you know, go, it's flowing up. Now, the real Shishumna starts from the heart, as far as eternal life's concerned. Down here it's been clouded. You know, it's a passageway that's heavily populated, like a freeway that's jammed with traffic, you see, and souls are having a hard time moving beyond that. So some, you know, the real Shishumna opens up there and you feel her taking over. Ramakrishna is a good example of how that happened in a human form in contemporary times. Then <clears throat> soul walks the skies, in the name of the chart. And so Queen Chudala said to her husband, father, her husband, king, who said, when, well, in my meditations, I walk the skies. Do you do that yet? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. You're a woman, you can't do that. So. Uh, talk about liberated women long before uh, the, the time. Uh, she was one of the ancient realized souls that they look back on along with Sita and, and uh, Lopamudra and Maitri and Gang, 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 Gangiji and those, those kinds of souls. Beautiful uh, female souls that realized the highest truth and were actually teaching so walking the skies, of course, is, is probably, you know, describing what souls do when they're vibrating at these higher chakras. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, now that I've awakened there, then now I run a boat race between these three centers. Like, I never know where my consciousness is going, you know, here, there, or here. Here is, of course, near the Kalpa, and here is, is uh, highest vision and here is speaking dharmic truth all the time. So his soul is always moving between these three subtle centers, spiritual vortexes, lotuses, chakras, however you want to call them. And the thing about walking the skies is that you, you begin to have communion with other beings who are walking the skies. It's an immeasurable blessing and it confers so much subtle power. So basically why he started answering Rome's question, how does one make oneself fit for higher powers? Uh, by realizing the true self and essence within and then communing with other souls who have done the same. It's like an extension of holy company here on earth, sadhu satsanga, is to meet these souls in, a, in, in their own realm. Uh, there's a loka for all of them. There's seven realms, seven rishis, so you would meet the rishi of that particular realm. Vivekananda is said to be the Rishi of the highest realm, the leader of all the Rishis. And he manifested here on earth for to, to uh, be with Sri Ramakrishna in that work. So Kundalini, he summarizes it here. If the Kundalini is brought up and arrested in the heart, eternal life ensues. So you might say it's our, at least our penultimate goal to awaken to divine love and the divine wisdom that helps us do it. And if we can do that, then we're well started on our spiritual journey. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter if we don't reach the ultimate goal in this lifetime. Nevertheless, we will be well uh, apportioned for our journey in another lifetime. We'll come back as conscious souls, loving souls, compassionate souls, and so forth, and reach the highest state of human awareness. So walk of the skies, an easy study, but of course, go to a teacher and find out how to practice all these things and what's behind them. Learn some of the systems that we've seen today and 
Vedanta, Yoga, Samkhya, and so forth, they're all offerings from these highest realizers of truth from time immemorial. And they're available to us now in this day and age, mainly due to Swami Vivekananda's bringing them here in 1893. So uh, he says, the sun may rise in the east, but it sets in the west. So he knew India was not in its best. It had fallen very low from its original status over these several thousands of years. And uh, now the west, it's a west turn to see if the sun sets here, if we can really take these teachings and, and uh, practice them and realize them in this very lifetime. How many lifetimes do we have left in America? How many lifetimes have we lived in America? Three or four? So if you're continually manifesting as an American soul, that is, following that train, which probably many souls are, because that's what they got used to in their samskaras, and then, was, uh, you know, how, how, how long did the Roman civilization last and in its heyday, and how long will America last? So I always think of America not in terms of its troubles and, and even its potentials, but that it's a bubble in which you can practice your own religion without persecution. So that, at least it has that. So you don't have to hide out necessarily from these influences. I think basically because the devil here, if there is any devil, is distraction and enjoyment. So people will go along the path of enjoyment and they probably won't end up pushing the button on you to release missiles because you produce the best cigars or they like or the best beer. Well, wait a minute, no. I don't think so, not yet. So Mother always has her finger on that finger and uh, enjoyment is one of the entrancements. So this, and entrapments. So this Upanishad is talking about that in conceit of both our body senses and objects. And if we can get beyond that, then we can become qualified to be a knower of truth. What's impeding you, even if you have a desire to know the truth, might be there in that conceit, in that pride. Pride goeth before a fall, right? Or was it cometh? I don't know. Anyway, you need to uh, take care of those six passions and along the way and so forth and, and consider the sense objects as being empty and non-fulfilling ultimately. And teachings like that will combine in you, if you study them, to cause you to make Siddhanta. Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagadcha Lakanda Rupa Stitir Eva Moksho Brahmadvitiya Shrutayaha Pramanam. It is the final and apt conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. Time, space, living beings, and the world. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect, and one without a second. And the revealed scriptures are the sure and certain proof of this fact. Om peace peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om